You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Imagine you've booked a dazzling vacation home perfect for your honeymoon. Nice. The house has it all. A pool, a spectacular view, and also the weird owner who lives behind a locked door in the hallway. Hello. I can assure you I shan't be watching you during your stay. So why even bring it up? Nope. We're leaving. When you'd like a romantic vacation getaway instead of having to get away from your vacation, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, you can expect accommodations that meet your expectations. Hilton for the stay. She said, if you decide that this is something that you want to do, keep my number, call us when you get out, we'll re-audition you and see where you're at. And I said, by the way, what was the audition for? And she was like, oh, well, Whitney Houston has a project that she's working on right now. (gasps) (gasps) And I was just like, ah! That hurts. That hurts me. I'm sorry. (laughs) All right, y'all, let's do this. I'm so excited to be here. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals. We are two perfect strangers who met by chance and embraced opportunity. (laughs) Do we ever not laugh? Do we ever not laugh? (laughs) Wait, wait, I'm not done with the intro. Listen in as we chat with other successful people about the risks that they've taken to put themselves on a path to creative success. That's Alan's broadcaster voice. It's your line. I know, but I'm oh. <laughs> just laughing at your broadcaster voice. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm really excited, actually, because this is my first opportunity to get to know our guest, who Alan is already friends with, and we are going to welcome James Harkness to the podcast. Do you uh, want to read his Friends bu- is an uh, no. interesting <laughs> choice of word. <laughs> um, wow. I'm, just, I'm just saying. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, shut up and let you read my um, introduction. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, okay, here we go. James made his Broadway debut in Aida back in 2001 before moving on to production. On to production as Chicago. I can't. My oh wow. You wrote this. You I wrote, wrote this. But before moving into Chicago, The Color Purple, Guys and Dolls, and the Dream Girls tour, and of course, Beautiful. And now that Broadway has returned, his re- he has resumed his role as Paul Williams in Ain't Too Proud on Broadway. He's also a Navy vet, and he embraced his fear, took a chance, walked into a dance studio one day while on leave, and the rest, as they say, is history. Hashtag insert cliches. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, what do we God. feel about people who say the word hashtag in conversation, James? Um, it, the same way I feel about people who say BTW and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> Wait, is, that, is, that what, is that what people do do that? Friends? Oh, BT dubs, I do say that. <laughs> <laughs> My and, and, the, and the dumb thing about it is, I was teaching a, a, a dance class at some point in time. No, I was choreographing a production somewhere, and one of the uh, ensemble members said BTW such a, and I was like wait a minute wait 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 <laughs> is that like, actually you... shorter than by the way <laughs> exactly I was like it takes more syllables to say BTW than by the way I say, my... BRB. I say BRB is that all right my 15 year old said no bedroom lol and board what? the other day <laughs> you said what she said lol and I said, what oh. are you trying to say? <laughs> and so she was just pronouncing LOL. And I'm like, wait, who does that? She's like, that's what we all do. I'm like, y'all say lol? And then, <laughs> okay. Sorry, Instead of laughing. <laughs> Instead of just laughing. Somebody told me yesterday, uh, not yesterday, the other day, they said jail. You have to do the hand movement, but they go, that's jail. <laughs> have you heard of that? Jail, as yeah. in J-A-I-L? Yeah, like it's so bad, it's jail. Wow. Peace, peace, so it's peace. like, it's. I can't. P H A T or Michael Jackson badge. Yeah. No. Okay. We're we're obviously (laughs) talking about James Harkness here. I have to tell a story about when I was on a a plane. uh, Last time I was on a plane, which was two years ago at this point, where the old couple behind me were like, Can you believe kids these days say dope instead of cool? 
They, <laughs> they might as well be saying cocaine. And I wanted to turn around and say, like, really, when you like something, is it literally groovy? Is it the cat's pajamas? Like, where, where do you come off? Right. Is it the bee, right, right, do bees right. have knees? Like, right. where, wh- why do you got to be so literal? Like, enjoy your um, life, man. Yeah. Like, no, there are definitely things. When it comes to stuff like that, I, I'm 100% with you. It's like there is there is slang that you're just like, why? Period. Every generation has had it. <laughs> why? <laughs> Period. <laughs> I like that. Okay, but if, if we're going to talk about literal things, I actually have a, a literal question for you, James, that okay. I um, – First of all, I, I love your resume. I think you're uh, I think you're a cool cat, My but resume. you don't meow <laughs> literally. I no. do meow actually. I do it at I, work. I believe you. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a story behind it, but keep going. I wasn't sure where we were going with that, and I thought we need to keep this clean. No, seriously. There's nothing clean I about this podcast. Would, you you are. For those of you who can't see you and aren't looking at your picture, you are a black gay man who was in the Navy. That Ooh. sounds like a lot of literal challenges to me. It was definitely a challenge, but there's a lot of beauty that came out of that challenge and a lot of finding myself and learning how to stand on my own two feet and taking chances, mm. you know, taking yeah. it, I, it took, it was a chance for me to go into the military um, because I had no other options at that time of my life. I mean, something could have come around, but where I was from, where I am from, El Paso, Texas, and how I graduated from high school, which I graduated well, um, you know, in the top of proportion of my class, but because higher education was not something that was encouraged <laughs> You're welcome. Ooh, if I could, if I could have, if I could have just kept talking, I should have just kept talking. You time, you time that toaster to accentuate your thought. I, I, I highly respect that. Um, but uh, that was not part of my upbringing. Um, my upbringing was: you graduate from school, you get a job, eventually you get married. You, mm-hmm. I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, so your life is actually centered around being a Jehovah's Witness. And that was not my journey. So when I graduated from high school, um, I didn't have any thing to look forward to uh, employment wise. So I did some of the things that a lot of some other kids did. You know, you go to the mall, you put in applications at this place, you put in applications at that place. You know, you you go around town, you hope to find a job. None of those things came my way. So the discussion was had is like, what do we do? Mm. And my father was in the military. Both of my brothers were in the military. So my mom was like, we should try the military. And went to the place and I joined the, I joined the Navy and that set my life on a course that ultimately has led me here yeah. to Broadway and, what? and through many steps along the way that I had zero idea that they were going to happen because none of them were planned. I didn't have that. Like a lot of people that I work with now, they went, they started dance at the age of six and they did acting in school plays. They did it in high school. They took drama. They went to school, to university, to Juilliard with musical theater degrees and opera degree, et cetera, et cetera. I have none of that in my life because none of that was where I thought I was going to go. I thought where I was did you ha- think you were going to go? I thought I was going to have a job. Even even after my time in the military and the things that happened to me in the military, my mindset was still, I'm going to get a job at some business and I'm going to have my little briefcase, my suit and tie, and I'm going to go to work every day and enjoy whatever the other parts of my life are. And that is... Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, talk about when... Um 
you know, the, I mentioned it in the opening bio that you were literally on leave. I think it was in California, if memory serves, right? And you walked well, by. A I wasn't studio. on leave. I wasn't on leave, but I, I was stationed. I had just gotten to San Diego, California, yeah. which is where I was stationed. And I had been to San Diego, California because my aunt lived there. So we used to go there summers. Um, Mom would drive us out to visit the family. But I'd never been there as an adult, quote, <laughs> quotations adult, <laughs> an 18-year-old adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or 19-year-old, whatever that age was. Um, and so I was walking around downtown San Diego one night after getting off my ship uh, working to uh, just see what the, what the city was like. And I was walking down 7th Avenue going towards downtown. Um, got out the trolley, actually, and I can't remember what street the trolley's on, but going down 7th Avenue, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I looked up and I saw this sign that said Stage 7, and there was nothing else on the sign but those words, and I looked through the door, and there was all I could see was stairs leading up, and so my brain having Mm -hmm. danced and stuff like that in high school and grew up, grow up liking music and all that sort of stuff. I just went stage. Well, it has to be something with performing. Right. So I went back the next day, got off the ship, headed straight there and walked in and walked up the stairs and I could hear music as I came up and I could see, I saw a reception desk and I saw dancers sitting, stretching and There were two class windows where classes were happening. And I literally was just like, oh, I felt (laughs) I felt like I I found I found a piece of heaven. And it was something that Mm. I was looking for, but I didn't know that that's what I was looking for necessarily. But I knew something in my life was missing. Okay, so I love that. And I have, over the course of my life, gotten really comfortable with recognizing my own intuition. In fact, I feel a a yes, like I'm going to do this if it shows up in my solar plexus and my belly. And if it shows up in the back of my neck, it's a no, like that's a bad sign. Do you have, are there any signs for you, James, that you're like, this is a chance I want to take. I wasn't expecting this, but I'm going to jump on this. Like, how do you know? Huh. Um, I don't know. I I mean, we all have intuition and sometimes that intuition is something as simple as you go, oh, I should take this with me, but then you don't. And then later on, you're like, I should have taken that with me. I should have taken it with me. And that, um, that happens to every single person when it comes to other things. I don't know. There have been things that I have been afraid of trying and I didn't realize until after that that fear was something that I needed to run towards instead of run away. Mm. Um, How long did it take you to get there, though? um, I'm still not fully there. (laughs) You know? But I'm, I'm, I'm so much closer than I've ever been because I, after enough experiences have happened where that fear, it's just human fear. We all have it. But it's not like, fear that an animal is going to rip my, my throat out. It's for me, it's fear of failure and fear that people aren't going to like what I do, that I'm going to be judged, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the kind of fear that I deal with. Yeah. And lots of people do. Yeah. Most people do. Um, in, in all walks of life. And I have learned, and even in talking with my mom, uh, I would just said this, like two nights ago, actually, that even even within that, if you do go and do something and maybe it doesn't go off the way that you hope that it might. But you still accomplished it. That is a that is success. Yes. And understanding what success is and your your perceptions of success is very important and those things have shifted for me as years have gone on and as I have shifted what understanding the understanding of success is it has helped me broach it helped me face my fears easier do you do you consider failure also to be successful i guess in the moment it's a lot harder 
and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would like personally for me, when I'm in the middle of something fail, like that is catastrophically failing, hopefully it doesn't happen very often, but uh -huh. I think it's the end of the world. And then over time now, in my early 40s, I'm able to now look back and say, okay, I remember this feeling, but I can also remember the feeling that comes after it, which is fear, disappointment, whatever it is, will subside, and I can learn from this and hopefully yeah. prevent it in the future. It is a version of success as well because, again, you not only have you completed it, yes, maybe it burned, but you are able to step away from it and in time, just as you said, you're able to learn from it. And that is also, I think, a version of success if you're able to do that. Not James, everyone's you, able to do that. They're not. Do you think that fear can play a positive role in taking chances and being creative? Yeah, because if you don't find a way to face that, to confront it and conquer it, you don't grow. You don't learn. You don't grow. You don't succeed. Can you imagine the amount of people who we in this world revere on so many walks of life that just because they've conquered these things doesn't mean that they were not afraid to do so, but they faced those fears and they created stuff that we live by, live with. It's, I think fear is a very important part of the human growth process and the human success process, for sure. It's, it's valuable. And it, you know, it also teaches you things to be aware of and how to navigate things, but it's important. Well, I'm a big fan because embracing fears is my whole business, so mm. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, you've got you've got the I mean, the the career with with the show with Ain't Too Proud and uh, your own solo career with uh, I know that, you know, last time we did a formal interview, um, you were promoting Broadway Buskers concert series. And so you had written your own music and were performing that. And you've got stuff with the Wiggles. Uh, you've, of course, the James Cafe, which is part of the ever popular Wiggles. Where, where are you, uh, I guess at any given point in the day, right? How are you deciding where to focus your time? And I, going back to Heather, one of Heather's earlier questions about like, what draws you to a yes? What, do you, what is your intuition leading you to? Where, where is your solar plexus? How do you determine where your solar plexus <laughs> needs to, needs to pull you out and take you to the next place? <laughs> That's uh, a really actually wonderful question. Right now, because Ain't Too Proud is very much time consuming and getting back into or forward into the swing of things, um, my focus honestly right now has been on self-care. Um, yes. So that's where my main focus is. But I am still pushing here and there on like my solo music and stuff like that. I just worked with one of the people that I write music with um, on something that I've been wanting to work on. So that is happening. I think for me right now where I'm at in my life, the thing that pushes me forward is just knowing that there are things that I want to do and time is limited. And as I, as you, everyone gets older in life, you lose more and more and more time. And at this <laughs> age that I am at, um, I have lived a really amazing life, but I have also not done things because I was afraid to do them. And mm -hmm. you don't get that time back. As I look forward, I'm like, I, if I want to do these things, I have to get them done because no one can do them but me. Yeah. And I was talking to another, uh, the same person I was talking to about success. And he's also an artist, and we were just discussing getting doing the, the things that we want to do. And there's, I, I, I can't, this, that saying or a version of the saying is, you know, you got to, you got to put your stories out there. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, actually, it's a little bit more in depth than that to me. It's like, you have to put your stories out there because if you don't, 
no one can do it for you. No one can tell your personal story. It's not a culture thing. If you have something that you want to say, you need to do it. And so those are the things that I think about and go after what we've gone through and the amount of lives that have been lost unexpectedly due to something that, you know, that's, that's a whole onion to get into. <laughs> that we could have maybe prevented if we'd had good leadership. Sorry. We, or we could have, <laughs> we, well, yeah, we could have circumvented a, a good portion of it. Mm-hmm. There was no way we weren't going to lose lives because it's a, it's an illness. It yes. is, it is what it is, but we could have probably lost a whole lot less lives had we had the proper leadership. Mm-hmm. And if we also had people, because leadership, 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 sure, but we also have, have humans in life who are idiotic and they want to do what they want to do. <laughs> well, okay. So yes. there's also that. <laughs> um, but that, that, is, that is something that I keep in the forefront of my mind. It's like mm-hmm. you have to use the time that you're given. Yes. You said something, though, that I find really fascinating, and I want to take it apart just a little bit. Uh-huh. Um, there were, you said there were, it's not politics, I promise. You said there were a lot of chances you didn't take mm. because you were afraid of them. Mm-hmm. And, and that, I think, we can, we can hold a lot of self-resentment for that, things you wish you'd done, because now you know you can, you've seen yourself succeed, except... Do you ever think, gosh, if I had taken this chance and that opportunity, then this other thing that was so much better wouldn't have presented itself to me? Like, do you think the chances you didn't take maybe led to the chances you did take? That is always the case. That is how walking through a door works. You walk through a door, it leads you to another door. And if you, and you know, if if I had, if I had turned to the left it would have taken me where it took me. Maybe it might have got me somewhere. Yeah, the answer is yes because <laughs> I know it's, it's, uh, you know that's that's a like tricky road, but um, because I was talking about to someone about uh, a thing that happened to me when I was still in the military, and I had found that dance studio. Look, we're back to the story. In taking these dance classes and and finding a joy that I hadn't had in a while, of course, I meet other dancers. And one dancer that I met in particular, her name's Roberta, she was like, hey, they're having auditions for an agent in L.A. You should come audition with me. And I was like, no. <laughs> and she was like, you should come. And I was like, why do I don't an agent? I, I, I don't know. The, uh, ultimately, at first, the answer was no. And then she talked me into it because in my head, I was like, what do I need an agent for? You know, my brain at that time was like agents were Hollywood and television and movies mm-hmm. and stuff. That was mm-hmm. what it and was. You were a dancer. Me. I was a dancer. And, and also, I wasn't I was dancing for joy. I wasn't mm-hmm. dancing because this was going to be my career. Like I said, my thought process was I'm good. I have a trade that I'm learning in the military. I'm going to utilize that when I get out and I'm going to have a job. James, you mentioned uh, a while ago that now that Ain't Too Proud is back, Broadway is back. And uh, our audience is not primarily Broadway focused. And so mm-hmm. I want to actually just cover that real quick because people think you sing and dance for a living. That's got to be one of the easiest jobs in the world. And you mentioned uh-huh. specifically self-care. Eight shows a week. I say uh, Broadway performers are the Olympians of theater. Mm-hmm. Certainly. So you are at the top of your game. You have to make it seem like it's your first show every single night. So talk to us about the self-care that you have to get through. For myself personally, it's just taking care of my body on all levels. Be that physically, making sure that muscularly that my like that I'm not achy that my that I can do all the things that I need to do and you know there's injury prevention and so you know acupuncture physical therapy massages whatever all of those things that that different people do I do those three 
just to keep myself moving. You know, I am human. I have been in this business for a minute. I've done a lot of stuff. And you, as you do in regular life, you garner injuries along the way. So I deal with those types of things so that I can do the show, my show the best way that I can. So rest plays a very important part, not only for my body, but also for my voice, taking voice lessons um, and resting your mind and your spirit. That, that's, it's very important. All those things play a part because what we have to do as actors, you utilize every, every feature you have, you utilize it every night. There's no point where my mind is at rest or my body is at rest, or it, I have to utilize every single thing that I have. And that is like a digit. I have to, util, you know, we use our fingers every day, but the way in which I have to use my fingers is not the same <laughs> during a show that, that somebody does on a regular basis or somebody that works in an office does. It's mm-hmm. a very, very different thing. Like my knuckles on my <laughs> well, I, on my right hand, my thumb knuckle, the the ma- the major one that's connected right to your hand, and the uh, the second finger, that middle knuckle as well. There was a period where I was like, "Why are my why are my knuckles so sore? I don't understand why I'm in pain." And I realized that because we snap in the show. Oh, oh, that makes so much sense. We snap all the time. That's part of the aesthetic of our show. Wow. And my hands were hurting simply because we snap throughout the entire two and two hour and whatever minutes on stage. That's a lot of snapping. And it, and it wasn't, I wasn't the only one. The, all, the other guys were feeling the same thing. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a small thing, but you just kind of go, ah, yeah. because we, we really do utilize everything to get the job done that we do. So it definitely takes a lot out of you. And then you're doing, right now we do seven shows a week. Normally the Broadway schedule is eight shows a week. I am so thankful that we only <laughs> have seven shows a week okay. because that one extra show makes a difference. And people don't understand that. I don't even think producers really understand just what that takes out of you. Mm-hmm. Unless they've done it. You know, some, which- and, some, and there are producers that used to be Broadway performers. I think that the general producer, big time producers especially, they, they're not performers. So they don't have the understanding of all that it takes to do a show and to keep yourself up to do a show. Imagine you've booked a dazzling vacation home perfect for your honeymoon. Nice. The house has it all. A pool, a spectacular view, and also the weird owner who lives behind a locked door in the hallway. Hello. I can assure you I shan't be watching you during your stay. So why even bring it up? Nope. We're leaving. When you'd like a romantic vacation getaway instead of having to get away from your vacation, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, you can expect accommodations that meet your expectations. Hilton for the stay. Is the beginning of every show for you, knowing knowing the stress that goes into your body and the, I mean, you look at the people in the audience, you can see the audience from the stage <clears throat> and you can see everybody there. The, uh, many of the people have never seen it for the first time. Is there fear? Is there pressure for you to go out at the beginning or before every show? Do you have a moment where you're like, I acknowledge you fear. I know you're here, but I got to get over you and I got to go on stage and I got to give it the the better show a uh, more effort than I did yesterday or, or, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Is there some, is there some part of you that has to prepare every single time or is it just muscle memory at this point? It's not muscle memory, but it, uh, it is also muscle memory because it is in my muscles. So I know what I'm doing. Emotional but, memory. <laughs> uh, emotional memory is actually a very, that's interesting. And that, that I, I will touch on about the roller coaster of the show. But no, there's not fear of trying to go out there and do the best show that I can because I agree with you 100%. I've also spoken on this before. Is I do have a responsibility. One of my castmates asked me, How do you do the show the way you do the show mm. every night? And I was like, The base of, of that answer is because I love what I do. Period. Mm. Period. Um, but also, 
the other factors in that are I have a responsibility to myself as an artist. I have a responsibility to the other performers that I'm on stage with. And I have a responsibility to the audience because just as you're saying, these people, many of them are coming to see the show for the first time. Many of them, this may be the only show that they're able to see. This is the one that they saved up mm -hmm. the money to buy tickets for, whatever show that is. And so I, I owe them the best that I've got. So it's not a fear thing. It's an obligation and a responsibility thing for me. With muscle memory and emotional memory, you know, it's funny that you say that because the show, to have the show be fresh, and, and I attempt to make that happen. I do my best to stay aware of the things that I'm doing within the show so that I'm not doing them just because that's what I do. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. oh, like yeah. there are certain things that have to be choreography has to be as close to what it originally was. And sometimes that's impossible because your body is different every day. You feel different every day. So sometimes that hand gesture is the same hand gesture, but it's not exactly the same because <laughs> It, it's somewhat impossible, but that is what we do as dancers. We <coughs> recreate. Because your snapping thumb hurts. My yeah. snapping thumb hurts. But, well, honestly, I actually in, I injured my thumb uh, three Mondays ago at home. And oh, no. so, mm -hmm, so I actually had to fake snap. <laughs> and for and for a couple of days, I actually couldn't, because I couldn't move my thumb, but I also could not do my show. I, I couldn't actually snap, snap. So I was moving that second finger to make it look like I was snapping while not moving my thumb. So these are things that I also was having to think about throughout the whole entire show is how do I get through the show with a thumb that is hurting like crazy? I have to do costume changes and you have to put your hand through a shirt hole and you have to button your shirts. You have to button your pants. There are things that, and it's my dominant hand. So these are all things that I'm thinking about, mm -hmm. but um, so many things, right? But emotionally, and so many things, yeah. Emotionally, the emotional journey of the show, unlike unlike muscle memory, for me personally, I do my best to not just rely on that because I have worked with actors that I've watched them do a show and not saying that they they weren't giving their all, but their show was almost identical every time that they did it down to mm -hmm. the movement of a finger. And this is not in, in a choreographed moment. It's in a acting moment. So it's robotic. And, but some people live in that way. Like for some people I've realized that that is how they do their best show. Like they know what works and that is what they invest themselves into. For me, so, I have to try and be as emotionally present in a moment as I can be. And what can be difficult about that is if it's an emotionally charged moment, but you're not, it's like say that day, you're not in that space. Like sometimes it's easy to get to an emotionally charged scene if you're already in that space. Yeah. There's something in your life that's happening so you can, you can get those tears or that anger comes up easily or whatever. Then there are times when that's not in your, in your system. And so you have to take that journey and that can be very difficult yeah. sometimes because you want the scene, I want the mm -hmm. scene that I'm playing with my fellow actors on stage and that this audience is watching for the first time, I want it to read as truthful as is possible. So emotional muscle memory is a negative thing for me. That's really fascinating. Well, it's not listening. It's not it's, active it's listening. Not, I mean, yeah. that, that's what you hear all the time, that, that the majority of good acting is saying nothing. You're just listening. You're being in the moment. You're being present. And I think that relates on a macro level to the whole purpose of this conversation of, of embracing fear, like being aware when the opportunities present you, right? Because there may be an opportunity on stage 
where something happens, somebody does something that they've never done before that gives you that moment to react to it. And if you're being robotic, yes, you're not going to be able to do that. And that is one of the, the ma- those are, those are when things are magical. And that's when I love when I'm working with performers in acting moments that are in that place that are paying attention to what each other are doing so that you respond. Am I saying the same line? Yes, I'm saying the same line. But because you said this line a certain way or your face did a slightly different expression or there was an intonation in your voice that makes me go, oh, all right. So this Mm -hmm. is how I'm going to respond to that. I'm still in the world of the story and the parameters of what I'm supposed to do. But there's that slight shift. And I've worked with people that don't do that. They what they do is they say you can say, wah 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 wah. And they're gonna go, wah 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 wah. And then or but then the next day you could go, wah 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 wah. And they're still gonna go, wah 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 wah. And then I'm like, hmm. <laughs> that wasn't fun. You took the fun away. <laughs> you took the yeah, in a little bit you did. You took the fun away. The and I'm like, because because you're not Maybe for whatever reason, it does. that's something that you weren't trained to do. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also another thing when I was saying, I don't have that kind of training. I didn't go to school to study Alexander Technique and all this kind of stuff. I come at acting from a life perspective. Yeah. There's another show about that, right? Alexander Technique? It was he one of our founding fathers? Uh, <laughs> 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 well, but you know what? It's interesting, Alan, that you bring up Hamilton. It always comes back to Hamilton. I don't know why. Alexander Technique. Uh, I saw boom. Hamilton. <laughs> Somebody get the hook. <laughs> Somebody uh, get the hook. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I saw Hamilton here in Chicago five times. And every time it was a different show, it's the same show, it's the same music. It's a, but every time it was a different show and I have favorites and they usually pertain to, you know, rap battles or whatever, where there is opportunity to sort of express some creativeness and to play around a little bit and to maybe not follow the formula 100%. And I'd love to know from you, James, like, when are you your most creative when you're doing your work? Does that in general, or are you speaking of in In, in general, crowd? in general. No, no, whenever, whatever feels good. When I, when I can be, when I have input creatively or when I am creating. Yeah. One of my recent, in, recent in the last couple of years, favorite times a couple of them but one of my most favorite things aside from doing my own like when i was writing the music for my concert but for my broadway buskers concert that i did that was a really special time because that was all my original music and i had to figure out in the confines of quarantine how i was going to do a concert from my home to present five songs of mine where i'm not that kind of singer (laughs) <laughs> who can who can sit on the couch and you're just going to sit there and, and listen to them sing because they have they have the riffs and the runs and they have the technique and all that stuff and they have that gift. I'm not that right. kind of a singer. I'm I'm an artist. I'm a performer. So I enjoyed this process of figuring out how to make this visually exciting So that it's not just like, oh, oh, he's singing another song. And his voice is the same as it was in the other song. (laughs) But I was like, how to create a visual presentation. And so that is where I'm the most happy is when I'm actually creative. When I worked with the Wiggles and we did La James Cafe, I loved L-O-V-E-D, capital letters, my time there, because... Not only was I a vessel for the work that they created for me, I was part of the entire creative process. Yeah. I, the songs that were written initially for me, they allowed me to modify the songs so that they worked for me, which 
ended up meaning I I sort of rewrote parts of every single song that I sung. And they were completely fine with that. I had input into that. I had input into certain bits of staging. I had input into what I did creatively as a performer. I wasn't just a vessel for someone else's work. And that is when I'm most happy. And I loved being there and watching them because that is how they also work there. Every, and Anthony is the captain of the ship. But everyone has creative input and ultimately he decides what is what, but it's an environment that allows everyone to bloom. And those things are very important. And that's when I'm my happiest. Was there a specific turning point where you, that you can identify like one thing, or was it a collection of events where you decided that you weren't going to let fear hold you back anymore? Um, well, fear is still holding me back, but, um, (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't sound like that's maybe true. It may be no, a story but to it, tell it you does so. because, <laughs> well, I, it is funny because people's outside perception of what my career is and what I have done in it, and it is all real, and it has been, it is amazing. And when I talk about it, and every time I get a chance to talk about it again. I am so thankful, so blessed, and so amazed. But there are things that I have not done that, I, that because I've been afraid. I, 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 another example that I didn't finish the, the, the earlier one, but this is one that's a little bit closer to my time here in, the, in, in New York City. Um, you know Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. Mm-hmm. I love those people with all my heart. And I was on tour with Aida, first Broadway show, and we had a little bit of a hiatus. So, of course, you know, you come back home. And I went to Broadway Cares because I like to go to the building just to say hi and see people. And I was sitting in the outs- outside of one of the office talking to someone. And Adrienne, uh, she pops her head out of the window and she, out of her office and she was like, oh, wow, James, I can't believe you're here. And she had a phone in her hand and she was like, Because right now, Jerry Mitchell is on the phone with me, and he was looking for you. Hmm. Talk about chance. Yeah. Wow. And, and, uh, and so he had, he had seen uh, a performance of mine that I had done for Broadway Cares uh, with Aida for the Easter Bonnet of the Year. And he wanted to know who I was. And he was trying to reach out to find me. And so he found me. There was an audition for a musical that he was working on at the time, and he wanted me to come in and audition for one for one of the leading roles. And so called my got in touch with my agent and everything was set up for that day. It was it was a that day moment. So I was I left the building. I'm talking to my agent on the phone and they were like, OK, so you're going to go to such and such a place. Oh, no, or was it for the next? Sorry, it wasn't for that day. It was for the, the next day. And I needed to go to such and such a place and bring my tap shoes. Da, 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 da. And I was like, tap shoes. And, and I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm not a great tap dancer. I'm I'm fine at best. I can do it if I have time to like work, then I'm, then I'm all right. But in an audition process, you know, you got to learn it on the spot. You know, you get 30 minutes. So I was like, e. I didn't want to go in front of Jerry Mitchell and make a fucking fool of myself and waste his time. Don't say the F word. We don't say fool on this podcast. That we- <laughs> Shut up, Alan. Shut the fuck up, Alan. <laughs> Hey, Alan, would you shut the fuck up? Please shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Is that our new theme song? That is your new theme song. I will record it for you. I need a button. Whenever I <laughs> That's not fair. I'd never be able to speak. <laughs> So you did not audition. Is that where you're going? That is where I'm going. I I asked my agent to please respectfully 
apologize on my behalf and I didn't go to the audition. Do you think you could have done a good job tap dancing? It sounds like you're pretty good at learning new things. Here's what happened years later. I get asked to do a New Year's Eve in Times Square presentation of that that um, he was doing. And I finally get to now work with him. So I took the opportunity to talk to him in person about that moment because that never left my, my spirit. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever turn down an audition. Mm -hmm. And he was like, especially not one with me. Mm -hmm. He said, mm -hmm. because what you don't know about me is I like to work with my actors. And so I, so if you had come into the room, I would have worked with what you had to offer. And we would have created what, what, what I want. You know what I mean? We would have created and worked with what works for you. And he was like, so don't, don't say no. That was one of my first lessons, really, from someone else in conquering your fears, not being afraid. That speaks to Jerry a lot, too, to give you that feedback, too. Because mm -hmm. he could have just said, you know what, don't worry about it. And then just never called you in again. Mm -hmm. But also, it's a really good reminder that in general, in life, we should not decide for other people mm. what they will think of us. Yeah, sure. And in a situation like that, that's exactly what I did. What I am really curious to know, mm -hmm. if there is a particular person or mentor or relationship that is really special to you that absolutely happened by chance. There are two. One, the first one is... Tiger Martina, who is, he is my mentor um, as a choreographer specifically, but also just as a human being. I, I adore the man. Mm. Tiger used to dance for Paula Abdul. Never heard of her. Bef before, I know she, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> Wait, she's famous on TikTok right now, right? Right, 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 right. Did you say, did you say TikTok? <laughs> I need you to leave the building. <laughs> Um, so when, when I was in my, my military days, pre-military and military days, it's, it's freaking Paula Abdul. And, uh, so one of her concerts, her first concert I went to that her under my spell tour. And I love that tour. That's that, that, that was like, those dancers were everything to me and still are, um, so life moves on and I just used to watch that the video came out on DVD. So I bought the DVD <laughs> and I watched it over and over and over again. Actually, it came out on VHS first. That is how old we are. I am. Um, I am too. I am too. It's speak okay. for yourself. Okay. You are, so, you are a baby. Um, <laughs> and, Shut uh, the fuck up, Alan. <laughs> um, so I, um, years pass and a friend of friends of mine, that I knew in San Diego, that I met at that dance studio, have now moved to Las Vegas. And they are reach out to me one day and they were like, hey, we, there's an audition for a show out here that we think you would be great for. And so we can you put uh, together a videotape? And I was like, yeah. So you're gonna be sending it to the, I think the dance cap, I think he, at the time he was a dance captain. So they were like, this is the person that you're going to be sending it to. And it was Tiger Martina. And I was just like, oh, he's the guy from the Paula Abdul tour. So I did some Paula Abdul choreography from that Paula Abdul tour. And that is how Tiger came into my life, just by someone reaching out to me for an audition that I didn't get. <laughs> I didn't get the job. But eventually, Vegas came into my life randomly, as so many things have come into my life randomly. We finally got a chance to work together, and I, there's so much about me creatively that all goes back to him. Um, and because, he, because of the foundation that he lives on, which is people like Paula Abdul and the old jazz masters, Bob Fosse, et cetera, et cetera, that 
his way of creating the detail that he puts in the thought process of the whole visual, et cetera, et cetera, which also led me to meeting his then partner, who as a singer and a dancer and a choreographer also, he, Tony Perry, who's no longer in the business, sadly for me. Um, I learned so much from those two men. And the way that I perform now is directly linked to those two men. And doing Ain't Too Proud is directly linked to the things that I learned while I was in Las Vegas. So, yes. And then my other mentor, I don't know if you want to call him a mentor, but he kind of fits into that category, uh, is Sergio. Uh, Trujillo, who's our choreographer Trujillo, for, yeah. for Ain't Too Proud. And Sergio's uh, an interestingly a similar type story. Um, my first... Okay, so I go to L.A. with this girl. She says, come with me, audition for the agent. I said no. She talked me into it. We drive down to L.A. and I said... She said, you know what, just come with me as a support and at least experience what auditioning in L.A. is like. And I said, great. We go. I put on my number. We audition. The agency was really great. And they were like, if we don't call you, if we, we're interested, we'll call you within a week. If, we, if you don't hear from us, keep working. We just think you're not ready. Come back and audition another time. I leave. We drive back. The next day, I get a phone call from the agency because they wanted to sign me. What? And I was like, what? exactly. And I was like, oh, um, because they had an audition that they wanted me to go on, that they thought I would be great for. And I was like, I'm in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and there was I can't a moment like, of just quit. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there was a moment of silence. And it was like, oh, oh, well, that's wonderful. You know, thank you for your service. Da 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 da. And uh, that's too bad. And uh, okay. And they were like, so what do you want to do with this? And I said, I said, I don't know. Um, I said, I, I like dancing. I just, I had no thought process of what dance was going to be in my life aside from just pure joy. So she said, if you decide that this is something that you want to do, keep my number, call us when you get out, we'll re-audition you and see where you're at. And I said, by the way, what was the audition for? And she was like, oh, well, Whitney Houston has a project that she's working on right now. <gasps> And I was Ow. just like, ah! that, that hurts. That oh. hurts me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so clearly, you know, I, I stayed in the Navy. But years moved down. Wow. Because do... court marshalling didn't seem like a good alternative. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> um, so I get out of the military. I'm getting, I'm working with temp agencies and going on job interviews. I eventually in the course to get a job. Um, but I also we decided to reach out to the agency because I've still been taking class all this time. And I reached out to the agency and I said, you know what, I can just try it. I have no idea what it's going to be. And they re-auditioned me, they signed me, and they started sending me out on auditions. And I went to my first big audition. The first audition was a small one. The second one was a big audition which was for the Oscars, which was for Debbie Allen, oh, wow. which, which made my brain implode that I was <laughs> going to be in a room with Debbie Allen because Debbie Allen is Debbie Allen. And especially for me at that time period, fame was a huge part of my life. So I go to this audition. I walked into a room of all male dancers from the Hollywood in LA, all the male dancers, many of them who I'd seen in music videos that had been on tour with Paula Abdul, people that I'd seen in television commercials, people that had toured with Michael Jackson. I was, I was standing in this room with these people and I got scared and I turned around and I walked out of the building. And then I stopped myself and I was like, if you don't do this, you'll never know. So I turned around and I walked back in and I auditioned. The person, there was this guy who was auditioning, who was Debbie's assistant, and it was Sergio. And I didn't know it at the time, who he was. 
until years later. Now New York Broadway has come to me also by chance. And I book a broad, well, I book two Broadway shows. And I get my first Broadway show, Aida. I'm asked to come in to this audition for a workshop. And who's in the room running this audition but Sergio? Mm. <laughs> and I walked into, because I never forgot him from that audition. And the reason I never forgot him was not necessarily the audition, but when the show was broadcast because I didn't get that job. But I watched that piece over and over and over and over again because I was like, oh, I had learned all that choreography and I didn't get the job. But I watched it and I went, oh, yeah, I wasn't ready for that job. I, there was no way I was mm. going to be able to hang with those dancers. But now I find this man in my life because I watched him dance on television, on video, rewind, 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 trying to learn the choreography and learn the steps. And now I'm in a room auditioning for him. And all these years later, now I'm in a, t in a show where he's finally won his, um, he's won his first Tony and I get to be a part of that. And it's such a wow. crazy special thing that is a part of my life. So, um, I mean, your life is insane no. right now. Anyway, last time I saw you was was out in the Hamptons. You're doing a production for a theater that Julie Andrews co-runs, and and you're on TV <laughs> yeah. the other day, holding hand, literally holding hands with John Legend. <laughs> with John Legend, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, James, you're feeling you're feeling a lot right now, aren't you? I love what I do, and I'm completely grateful and blessed for the things that I have done. Mm -hmm. I am aware of what my career is. I have insecurities about things because I also am aware of, of my peers and what their careers are. Peers that I, we started in New York City at the same time or peers when we started dancing in LA at the same time where their careers have gone to. And I have that tendency as we do as human beings to compare myself to other people. Um, I do much less of that now, but I still do it. And I see shortcomings and things that I, that I'm not doing or that I, maybe I, if I had done this, had I gone to this audition, <laughs> would I be here? Had I gone to that Jerry Mitchell audition, would I have booked my first principal role back in 2002 versus 2000? and 19 or 2000 and yeah, 2002 versus 2019. Mm -hmm. Would that have happened? You know, you were saying, uh, Heather about ha having had missed opportunities, would that have led you here or there? Had I had fear not taken a place or whatever? I I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said. And that's one of the things that I was getting ready to say about the Whitney Houston thing is years later also, by chance, I find myself working in, a, in an industrial with one of the guys that was on that Whitney Houston tour. Because what that tour <laughs> ended up being was, do you remember she did a concert for the troops? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what the project was. Wow. And so there, are so there are times when I think, had I gone to that audition, because what I also found out, when I ended up working with one of the guys that was on that and I told him the story and he was like, we would have hired you in a second. Hmm. And so I'm standing there with this guy going, <laughs> you know, um, and I look back and I go, had I gone to that audition, this is one, one episode, one version of the, of my thought process. Had I gone to that audition as someone who was actually in the military Whitney knowing that she's going to do a concert that was for the military. And I had booked that job, but let them know that, well, I'm in the Navy. What a boon that would have been to have for the military to have one of their own. I probably could have done my service for the military while dancing, while dancing with Whitney for the military. Can you imagine the publicity that would have been right? But, that's that's the exciting version of the of my thought process. The other version of that thought process process is that audition was at a very early point 
in my life. At that audition, I would have been 20 years old or something like that. Versus when I met this guy and we were working together, I was like 24, 25 by then. So I had five years of more training. By the time I got to work with him, I was a better dancer and performer than I was when the audition opportunity happened. So I also could have gone to that audition and not gotten it. We'll never know. And that's something that I never really thought about. I like, I, you know, because the joy and is thinking about, oh God, what could have been, especially when you meet someone that says, oh, we totally would have hired you. But he was also basing that on the dancer that he was working with at the time, not based on the dancer that existed back then. So it's so many, so many ways to think about if you go to a door and you open up that door and you go in it, is that going to lead you here or is it going to be a dead end and that's going to lead you someplace else? You know, you just never know. I think that's part of the really important thing to take away from all of this is is that there's always in everyone's life, no matter what, going to be those moments where we say, what if, what if? And if the anxiety and the stress of thinking about the past is not, I I, I just want to say let go of, like acknowledged and moved beyond, right? And And there's certain things, of course, that are bigger than others that you need to go back and deal with, whether it be trauma or whatnot. So that stuff, uh, not discounting that, but for these relatively benign decisions, like a decision, right? Um, you can't beat yourself up about it and you got to move forward and you got to learn. from Certainly. It. Yeah. And it's all yeah. there for you. Mm-hmm. Like the universe has your back, right? Like we get, we get where we are because of where we've been. James, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for spending so much time here with us. I appreciate it. Talking about my story with different individuals always brings up different things. And I can talk about the exact same thing, but depending on how the question is asked and the context in which it's put, it brings up a different viewpoint. Even a slightly different viewpoint. So I thank you, Alan, for being becoming a friend because you know the way that we met it could have been that one thing and could have gone on about our business you know what I mean Mm because I from that that moment at Google I feel like I'm probably the only person from that experience that you're in contact contact with with the frequency that you and I are in contact with even if at all Mm mm-hmm and that could have gone a different way. It could have been like, oh, hey, it was nice to meet you. And boop, boop. yeah, no, it's, but it's, I, it's learning. It's learning to trust. I mean, I, I make fun of Heather for everything, but it's the, the solar <laughs> plexus of it all. That'll be the already thick. So my solar <laughs> plexus, my 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 watering stick, my my water mm. stick, stick water. It, yeah, you that might want to. You might want to. I mean, dirty. No, and, I mean, and then dirty's fine. But you just need to you need to know what you're saying when you say so, it. So my, so my my man log was oh drawn okay man log to to like it's no. it was drawn people. to me. Wait, right. Heather, you might want to you might want to mute yourself so Al and I can have a co- a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I no. hope this whole thing better be on the damn podcast. <laughs> Yes, because I want I want the world to know <laughs> that Alan's water log, his his man log, was a, was directed towards me. <laughs> no, there there are people and situations like like we've talked about this entire conversation that that you just have to follow up on it. There have been times in my life where I have looked back and I have said, "Listen, I wish I had followed up or kept in touch or gotten that phone number or yeah, gone yeah. down that road." And Certainly. Then for, and then for you again, it's taking a chance because who am I? You know, when we first meet, you're you're this guy on Broadway, and I'm this other guy that like does it. You don't know me. You don't know if I'm some weird old creeper. And True. and I mean, I mean, I, mean, I am. You are whatever. right. <laughs> uh, but but thank you too for just like being open to a new friend. It is so hard to make new friends as adults. And well, you know what? You guys were you chance. guys were good people. And 
then meeting you guys, um, that everyone that came in to, to like help out and make sure our sound was good, et cetera, et cetera. You guys were all nice people. You were very, you were nice. You know, you, we exchanged numbers and, but I just remember you being a kind person, but I, and I remembered your kindness and saying, well, Hey, yeah, let's keep in touch. And, and we did, but even still, you know, sometimes you do, you, you have that one or two texts with someone that you keep in touch with and it just falls by the wayside. Mm-hmm. We, we've all had that experience in whatever avenue in life. It's always fascinating to me, the people that stay in your life. And I'm appreciative of that. So Chance I is say a funny thing. You. Chance is amazing. And, Chance well, is amazing, but then there's the purpose be, then there's the action. So, you know, that's Heather, it. you were, you were saying, I mean, we were saying about you, that the universe has your back, but I say the universe will have your back if you're putting in the work. It's Absolutely. one thing to want things and to, to try things, or it's one thing to want things or say that you want things, but if you're not putting the work in, then the universe is not going to have your back and that thing is going to go someplace else. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the whole premise of the show is that manifestation isn't just thinking a thought, it's declaring a thought and then taking intentional action to create the thing. James, thank you. You are thank amazing. You. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate this. It was awesome. Much love to you both. That was a really fun conversation. James is a really cool guy. I like him so much. I do too. He's, he's so different. very serious. He's a very he serious is, guy. He is and he's not. I mean, so he's, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is because we, we hang out personally, right? I, I get the sense of humor that he's got, but he, he, <laughs> is very analytical and very emotionally explorative. Yeah. Like he looks for the meaning behind everything. And I, I like highly, that. I highly respect that about him. Yeah, I liked it. And I have to give him all the credit because he on the spot wrote, performed and produced the what the fuck Alan song. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, the shut the fuck up Alan song. It's called the shut, shut the, the fuck, fuck up. up. The shut the fuck up Alan song. And, all right, so um, we're going to play that again right now. Hey, Alan, would you shut the fuck up? Please shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Okay, I don't know if the people listening were doing the same thing. You know, we are recording. We can see one another, you and I, Alan. Right, right. Um, and, and the whole time he, James was talking about the his knuckles and the snapping you and I were <laughs> we're like inspecting our fingers like wait which knuckle can you snap like that did you did you see yeah, that we, we were both right, doing we, that we were like <laughs> I was trying to snap without touching my fingers I'm doing it right now it's like I'm turning a giant uh, Gatorade bottle cap right now that's what I'm yeah, it's that's not what I'm doing. it's not working I suspect the people listening were also like wait counting was it second ne- second knuckle and third which one was that it was pretty great it was funny to watch he's very serious and he's really exploring his deep emotions and and you and I are playing with our knuckles on camera <laughs> <laughs> So let's wrap up. I have no idea how we're going to close this just because it's the first episode. And, you know, we're still building the finish line before we get there. Yeah. So, Alan's building the finish line while I stand on the podium. On the podium. Um, <laughs> please rate, review uh, as a new podcast. The ratings in the beginning are extra special and important. Share the podcast. Tell your friends. Check the show notes for social media and website information because it'll be there. We want to know how you are out embracing opportunity, taking intentional risk, or gosh, I don't know, was it chance? You can tell us all about it. Tag us or reach out on Instagram. We are, was it chance? Let us know what chances you took, how you embraced fear, and how you learned from failure. We'd love to share your story. 